I was talking about a movie called Room 335, which was released by HBO. Uh, it was made by three NYU film students uh, in 2005 who did, uh, as far as I can find out, this is something unique, who moved in to one of the residential communities and assisted living centres in Florida uh, and spent five weeks there living with the old, shooting 200 hours worth of documentary footage and then edited it into an 88 an 88-minute documentary that was released by HBO. It's not been viewed very much. I think there was only one person in the room this morning who'd seen it before, and that was in Denmark, Danish TV. So it seemed to me a movie that was worth talking about. It's contributing something I hadn't seen in the literature, really, which is a very improvisational response to the nature of friendship as they witness it among the people living in this residence and as they start to forge friendship links with some of the old people, the ones that we see most closely. So I wanted to use it as a platform. It's very difficult to come to a conference like this and talk about a literary text because even something like King Lear, you can't assume that everyone's read it recently and recalls it well. So you need something, you need a kind of cultural text that people have in common. So you, this is a, as a sounding board really for putting out some ideas about what the nature of friendship might be in a community like the Harbour Place community in Florida and how it might encourage us to think about possible connections between generations which have their own different versions of age self-consciousness. So how does being a very age self-conscious 19, 20 year old enable you maybe to relate to a quite different kind of age self-consciousness that's found in a place like Harbour Place? What I was trying to do really was to explore the notion that there are kinds of friendship which is sometimes, sometimes treated with a lot of scepticism from commentators outside but that I think shouldn't have quite that same measure of scepticism. They don't go deep. These are people who've only just met them, you know, each other recently. They know at some level that they're not going to be there for the very long duration, most of them. They're very practical friendships. They allow for things that living with one's own family in a care situation at home probably wouldn't allow for quite a lot of acrimony. There's a particular texture in these friendships that interested me. They're very practical, they're instrumental, and the fact that they're instrumental doesn't really deplete them. So, so they don't meet Aristotle's expectation that friendship is the highest of goods necessarily, but they allow you to think about friendship as something that's made out of the resources of the moment, and that actually has a very, very strong basis in practical care for each other without being necessarily particularly soft or affectionate or anything like that. They're very rebarbative, they're very aggressive sometimes with each other, they're funny, but when they're aggressive they're normally patting each other on the back at the same time or apologising it for it in some gestural way. And they really help each other out, so they're running a kind of parallel friendship community alongside the care that they're getting from the professional carers in the institution what the nature of friendship can then be with the boys whose presence is much longer than any sociologist I've heard of writing about the old, at least longer in terms of committed duration at any one time in the establishment. I have yet to find a sociologist who's actually moved in and lived with the old for a significant period. There may be ones out there, I'd love to hear about them if there are. But these boys are there for five weeks. Nevertheless, everyone knows they're going. So I wanted to ask some questions about what kind of friendship can you forge under those circumstances intergenerationally? And does it matter that everyone knows the boys' interest in them is partly instrumental? They're going to make a movie and hope to make a good documentary and get it released by HBO, as it turned out. So that's, those are the kinds of ideas I wanted to run with this morning. My name's Helen Small. I wrote a book called The Long Life that was published by Oxford University Press in 2007. And it's not written by a gerontologist. That's not me. I'm in the English faculty at Oxford. Um, but it's a mixture of philosophy and literature and the reason I wrote it was that I started doing a standard literary critical account of old age and it became pretty obvious to me that it was going to be very boring because <laughs> there are, maybe that's my fault, maybe it shouldn't have been boring but there are some pretty clear things that one would say about the literature of ageing um, uh, in my field uh, that it tends to split into optimistic accounts of the old, gaining wisdom from their experience and negative pessimistic ones of depleted capacity and misery and tragedy and so forth. And you can move that around and be subtle about it in response to specific texts, but it wasn't addressing the questions that I found I really wanted answered, which were in the end philosophical ones. So what difference does it make to our notion of a life if that life is lived much longer than other people's, than many other people's? What difference does it make to our notion of a person if they live a long time? What does the growing proportion of the old in our populations do to our notions of social distributive justice? Um, and is science telling us anything about these things that, um, that it wasn't telling us 
decades ago. So I, I pushed these and, and some other questions around first through the philosophy because the philosophers weren't doing that and that was the big surprise to me. I had assumed there was a very large literature in moral philosophy. There is, of course, a very big literature on them within the specialist, gerontological and medical um, communities of interest. But I wanted to address it without those disciplinary constraints, really, a, a kind of broader language for it, if you like, um, and deal with them as a philosopher and literary critic would. So that's what the book does. takes them first through philosophy and then tests them or expands them or makes them more complicated by giving you literary examples where the ideas are in play.